It's been a while since I made a video of Look What I Found. It's a series of videos where I keep on sharing with you some of the interesting things that I have found when I started using Reaper and that I keep on finding as a Reaper user. Remember that if you have any doubts or need any kind of support, feel free to leave a comment in the description or join us in the Discord server. There's a ton of people there that are happy to help, as so am I. I'm not always there, but I try to be present. So straight from Mexico City, my name is Juan Chis, and let's just go into Reaper. As usual, I'm trying to make like blocks of stuff so you don't get lost and you will see all of the actions in the description of the video so it's easy to find and recall whatever you saw in this video. Regarding the MIDI items, um, so remember that, remember that whenever you select, uh, have a selection in time, you can just use the action, insert new MIDI item. MIDI item, I love it, I love it, I love it. I love that word so much. And I'm using some shortcuts on my keyboard, such as zoom to MIDI item, so I can just bring it up. If I double click the MIDI item, I will open up the MIDI piano roll. Sometimes I'm using this when I'm sharing stuff between sessions or between DOS, or I'm trying to add some stuff in my session. So for example, I could have a couple of MIDI notes. You don't have to have an instrument for this. I will teach you a couple of examples of how I'm using it. And once you have some MIDI notes or MIDI events inside your MIDI item, you have to open your action list. This is something that might happen to you, so please pay attention. Since I open my action list with my piano roll open, it's opened in the section MIDI editor, but I want to use the actions of the main, right? So just be aware of that. It's something that could happen to you. So now that I am in the actions of the main Reaper window, if you don't have Reapack still installed, like go check uh, Mike's video or Reaper Vlogs video on how to do it, but you have to go into Reapack Browse Packages and download Convert MIDI Notes to Stretch Markers and, con and Convert Stretch Markers to MIDI Notes. What this will do is it will let you jump from one to the other. So the point of this action is that sometimes I'm editing or I'm building a production and I'm trying to get down or to nail down the rhythmic motif of something. So I much rather write it down in MIDI and set up a sample here with a resampler with a clavi or something that's super short so I get that something that's a rhythmic motive and then I can really really get my audio stretch into it. You can use the convert MIDI notes to stretch markers and there you instantly get them, right? Or <clears throat> I can have a source of audio that I'm using as a reference where I have different stretch markers. And now I'm trying to convert the stretch markers into MIDI. The thing that you have to pay attention to is that, is that this won't work if you just run it. You have to create the MIDI item and you have to have a um, piano roll editor open. Now, if I run this, and I select the media item that has the stretch markers, it will create them right there. <clears throat> Another great use of using MIDI notes as a reference for editing or for nailing down a couple of stuff. For example, if you're following a little bit less clicked uh, sort of work and you're trying to emphasize something and you want to add an effect or a sample or something, you might want to use the markers. So again, if you don't have it, just download Create Project Markers from Notes in Selected MIDI Items. So I can go here, I can create it, and now I have them. And of course, it goes both ways, right? <clears throat> this is extremely, extremely, extremely useful for mainly editing purposes, I think, and for some fine-tuning of your production or some instruments that are not playing all together. On the MIDI Items section as well, I would like to add that whenever you create MIDI items, they are just called MIDI, as you can see, MIDI 2, MIDI, whatever track you're in. But you have an action that you have to download from the RIA pack, rename items to track name. So if the track name is, I don't know, Harmony, these are still called MIDI. I can just click once the header of the track and run rename items, and they will change their name, as you can see. And they will change their name. <clears throat> There might be some situations where you need to select all of the items in one single track. You just double track the header and that does it. On the track section of what I found, 
is to create a VCA from the selection. If you're not using VCAs, that's fine. It's not something that you have to use, but it's good that you know it's there. It's also in the video that I made that's called uh, the tricks that, the tracks that you have to use for mixing. So maybe I have this kick, snare, overhead tracks, and I know that I could set the track grouping parameters by holding the three and relate to their volume, their panning, or any other feature that I might want. So whenever I move one, all of them move, but I'm moving the faders themselves. Difference with the VCA being is that if I create another track and use the track grouping parameters, select all of them to VCA follow, and this being the VCA drum to VCA lead, I can use this fader to control the level or the gain only before the fader after the effects but before the fader so that leaves me a lot of room so i can keep on adjusting all of my drums using my feathers without having to disable the groupings that i have up here on disable track grouping one interesting use here is that you can use the vca pre-effects follow so let's suppose that you're running everything into some auxiliary or bus and instead of shoving the faders into it, you could also increase the level into the processing themselves and you don't have to group as many tracks. It's just another way of doing it, but it works. So the action is to create a VCA master from selection. So I select all of the tracks that I need and I create it. And now everything is grouped. As you can see, I have all the way on the 64, my VCA one that's using the VCA lead and follow assign and the mute and solo with lead on the VCA and follow on the tracks. I don't know why does it do it so far down. Like I can kind of guess because it's harder to get in the way of some grouping that you might have already done. Just so that you know, it's all the way far down up until the 64. And I can keep on running that action and it's going to keep on creating those groups. And now it's 63 and it will cre keep on creating different groups. Remember, this is not running audio, so it doesn't matter if it's going out into the master or not. It's just controlling the level, leaving the fader free for other purposes. Another one that I saw, and I think I saw it later on another video from someone else, is that whenever you arm the track, it instantly turns red. And for this, we will use the rear pack we will use the SWS extension Auto Color. If you haven't set up your Auto Color for all of your tracks, I think you're missing out on some deep customization that will make your life easier. Here you can create any rule. Any rule you create will go numbered down. And since I have a lot of rules already done, I will just create a new rule for a track that's called Pew Pew, right? And I'm going to make it get a custom color that's going to be purple. Yeah, sure. And I could even add a layout. For example, let's call it 200. On my MCP, I want it to be 75. You can even add an icon to it. I'm going to use this 4D icon. Yeah. And that's pretty much all of the information that you can add to it. Just right click it and add it. And whenever I name this track Pew Pew, you will see that I will get the size expected and all of the configuration. If I change anything here, for example, all of the changes will happen instantaneously. It's as easy as that. And I love that, that the auto color and auto setup for my tracks. Since we are naming tracks every single time, that's such a time saver. You can also right click here and change other stuff and assign everyone. But up here on my number one, it's hierarchy based. On my number one, I have a rule tag for a track filter. Whenever it's a folder, a children, a receive, a master, an instrument, etc., etc. In this case, record armed. I will make that track set to a color that's red. And I can instantly change the size and, you know, everything that we have talked about. I could even add a small icon of recording if I wanted to, but for me that takes us space that I don't know if I want it to be used. <clears throat> but there you have it.
There's an action that I don't use as much, but I think it's useful probably for some people. So whenever you're cycling through your folder states and you have some children tracks of a folder track, you can just select the folder and set up some action uh, using maybe a modifier on something on your mouse or something like that to select the children also of that folder track. I thought that maybe there was some intuitive way of doing that, maybe double clicking the folder or hitting a modifier and then clicking the folder, but it, but it doesn't happen. So yeah, this seems useful for some scenarios. I don't use it, but seems useful. <clears throat> Especially when your folders start getting a lot larger, it's probably really useful. In that same workflow, there's also an action to select all folder start tracks. So let's suppose that we have folder one and folder two, and even folder three. So whenever I run this action, I'm selecting all of my folders. This could be useful if in your workflow or in your, in your way of routing your audio, this makes sense. Uh, last week's video was about using auxiliary or buses. Go check it out. It's all about having things organized and what could be useful for you. That's the only thing I'm trying to do. Give you options so you can pick what's best for you or what makes most sense for you. Let's suppose for a moment that you have this path. and you're running it through an effects. And I know that you could right click and freeze the stereo track and leave it like that. But sometimes when I'm doing music or mixing or doing stuff, I do end up rendering a lot of stuff and reusing it in other ways, like resampling a lot. So there's an action where you can render the time selection to a new track. Remember that by default, if you have, if you hold shift and double click the header of the media item, you will time select that. And now you can run this and now it's there without the processing. Then you could maybe, if you don't want it anymore, you can just hide the selected track. You mute it first, you disable the plugin and then you hide the track. And now you only have the resample value. There's also another action on close enough to the track section that I use a lot on the automation, on the, automa on the automation layer, where I just toggle the touch and trim and read modes. Remember that up here, up here on this known, known button, if you click it, you can see the different automation modes. I can probably make a video on it. But the point being is that most of the times I only use touch, or trim and read. So <clears throat> why? Because maybe I just want to do a small automation of a plugin. And since I don't want to go into the envelopes and look for the filter, since I don't want to go always on my track envelopes and filter it by last touch parameter, make it visible, and then go here and draw a line. Sometimes I just want to do it with my mouse and fine tune it. Most of the times for me, it's a lot easier to just switch to the touch mode. That means that whenever I touch any parameter on that track, it will be recorded into an envelope. So maybe I'm playing my track and as I move any parameter being a filter, panning, level, width, whatever, it's being recorded real time. This goes a lot in hand in hand with, I suggest having on the preferences, on the editing behavior, on their envelope display, to show the new envelopes in separate envelope lanes. Since you can always hide all the envelopes for all tracks or show all envelopes for all tracks, like I don't mind having a lot of envelope lanes at site. Also, this parameter under automation is really important to have the return speed at something that's more or less makes sense. For me, it's real slow because I like to have that extra going back into the session. Go check this menu out. You might find some interesting features here. But yeah, I like to switch between automation modes. Now I can just go back to read and now everything will move as expected. And last but probably really useful still are some of my navigation shortcuts that I end up using a lot. I try to move as fast as I can in the screen. That way I can always reach any place that I have to get to. Some people like to use under the view menu, the navigator. And if you have never seen this, this is a window where you can navigate all of your project. 
some people under the preferences, editing behavior, mouse modifiers, a range view, middle drag, like to use a hand scroll so they can move around their project. The navigator is the one that I don't use. The hand, I do use it. But sometimes I want to move from clips, from one clip to another. So I just migrated some of the actions on the shortcuts that I use them on Ableton Live, such as item navigation, select and move to next item. So it doesn't matter where my playback cursor is, I can just jump from one to another. And since I have it selected, I can do stuff to it and I can keep on coupling those actions by lowering the gain or muting it or doubling it or copying it and then moving my cursor to different places and pasting it elsewhere, trying to move fast with my keyboard. And of course, I have my option right and option left so I can move forward and backward. I have also been using a lot of these shortcuts like scroll right, scroll left, and I use them on 10% because I think that's wide enough for me. So whenever I have a bigger project, I can just use, in my case, I'm using the numpad of my, on my keyboard, and I suggest that you get a numpad. I think it's useful because those keys are pretty much never used on many shortcuts. So you have extra buttons there. So let's suppose I have a se uh, session that's this big and I'm zoomed in right here. I did that by toggling horizontal zoom to select the time selection. That's also useful because you can just double select a media item, a media item and then move to the width of it. But now I can start scrolling slowly across my session. I think that's really useful. I'm also using this combination of actions to zoom to media item, vertical zoom to selected items, then horizontal zoom to selected items, and then set time selection to items. And that's how I can just jump into a media item. And I combine that with the restore previous zoom level, so I can just go in and out whenever I need it. I have shared that action before. There's probably always some new audience, so it's never hard to add one action that I may have suggested before. And for handling the size of my tracks, I don't know why I ended up using Q. I think it's comfortable there, but I use Q to zoom in vertical, Shift Q to make them smaller. And if I have way too many tracks that are dispersed on their sizes and they simply don't make sense for everything and I just want to make everything super small, I'm using Option plus Q to toggle track zoom to minimum height. So I make all of them super small. I also end up using some zoom in and zoom out horizontal using the plus and the minus sign on my numpad. So there are a ton of actions that you can start using right now. As I said, everything will be in the description of this video. Let's keep on looking for stuff in Reaper that we run into and we might want to do some way and probably Reaper has a built-in feature into it. Sometimes if it's not built into it, you can just use the Rea pack and look for actions that the people have made. I also made a couple of Reaper actions that you can download for free, for free, and I will link them in the description and I will link that video where I show you how to use them and how to create your custom actions. And Reaper is huge. Like, let's just keep on grinding on it. Try to understand that probably Reaper will feel best if you have some objective. If you're just trying to get into Reaper and trying to learn the manual, you will get lost and you will get frustrated. If you have small projects, try building the way to work into it. Either building toolbars that I have also videos on it, looking for the actions, keeping this action list window open. A lot of the time when you're starting makes a huge difference in your workflow and to start knowing how Reaper names stuff. And yes, that's a lot of information. So if you like this kind of videos, be sure to comment, like, subscribe, share, and hit the notification bell and do all of those things that people on YouTube say. Straight from Mexico City, my name is Juanchis and thanks for listening.